endowment funds are still available in the entryway, and if there is a mission work that you'd like to see funded out of those endowment funds, please get that filled out and turned in as soon as possible. We do have a deadline, uh, December 15th. So while you do have time, I know how procrastination works. I've practiced it all my life. Actually, I've been waiting a long time to start practicing procrastinating. Just kidding. <laughs> um, if you know of a need, please get that filled out and turn it in. Put it in the trustees' mailbox. And, and uh, Lord willing, we'll have funds available so far. I'm sure it looks pretty good. But uh, if at the end of the year our endowment has been able to make money, we'd love to distribute it and help as many mission works that are bringing the gospel hope of Jesus Christ to many, uh, to as many as possible. So please. Please get those filled out. Praise Sunday is November 24th this year, and uh, we take an offering, a special offering, along with our regular offering to help with property needs. And we've we've invested in a lot of them. Uh, watch carefully when you walk down the sidewalk this winter. The, the roof is more slippery than it used to be. It's not a metal roof. That's one of the projects that's been done. But so many have been. And God has provided so well for the physical needs of our church. So uh, be prayerful about what God would have you give us as that opportunity comes around uh, yeah, November 24th. There will be a dinner after church that day and the special offering will be taken during the worship service. Today we have opportunity to receive the Lord's Supper during worship, so please be preparing to come as a sinner in need of grace. The uh, church council will meet after church today, downstairs, and uh, we're back to full schedule. Confirmation is at 5.30 on Wednesday, followed by youth. If you uh, haven't filled a box and intend to do so for for uh, project, what is it called, child? Uh, Operation Christmas Child. Operation Christmas, Christmas Child. Child. Those are hard words for me to remember some of them. Operation Christmas Child, get them filled and, and labeled and, and put on the table. It's good to see so many of them already filled. Thank you for all you've given. And, and uh, those need to be turned in November. Well, let's see. Next Sunday is about the last Sunday, isn't it? They have to go to Sydney on the 25th. Okay. So next Sunday is the deadline. Please get them in.
we'll read together our call to worship. Since we have been raised with Christ, the second part is on the things of love, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that our hope rests on the finished work of Jesus, not on anything we've done, not on anything we will do. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that we can rest with confidence in your grace, knowing that what Jesus has done is abundantly sufficient for all of our need. Through your word today, assure us of that. And Lord, call each of us to, to abandon any hope we've had apart from Jesus and to trust in him and him alone. Do your work in us and then work through us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And we'll uh, open with the hymn number 178, All Worship the King. Jesus called him 
and he wants Agrippa too to come to faith in Jesus. Acts 26, 12 through 26, in respect for God's word, let's stand together as we read this text, if you're able. So, Paul was on journeys persecuting Christians, putting them to death and putting them in jail. And he says to Agrippa, on one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, okay. As I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Then I asked, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen of me and what I will show you. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven, first to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and to the Gentiles also, I preached that they should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. That is why the Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But I have had God's help to this very day, and so I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Christ would suffer as the first, and as the first to rise from the dead would proclaim light to his own people and to the Gentiles. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You're out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. I am not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I am saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his, that's Festus's notice, because it was not done in a corner. Here is the reading of our scripture. Abiding steadfast, firm and sure, the statutes of our God endure. Blessed he who trusts his steadfast word, his anger holds him. text now covers two things. First, Jesus sending the twelve out to proclaim the message of the kingdom of God, and then second of all, the fact that Herod noticed what was going on here at the Tetrarch, which would have been a great uncle to the one we just read about, to uh, Agrippa. Luke chapter 9, 1 through 9. When Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out demons and cure diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He told them, take nothing for your journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra tunic. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. If people do not welcome you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave their town as a testimony against them. So they set out and went from village to village, preaching the gospel and healing people everywhere. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard about all that was going on, and he was perplexed because some were saying that John, this would be John the baptizer, had been raised from the dead. Others that Elijah had appeared, and still others 
that one of the prophets of long ago had come back to life. But Herod said, I beheaded John. Who then is this I hear such things about? And he tried to see Jesus. Heavenly Father, we long to see Jesus. Thank you for bringing him to our sight through your word and through the supper we receive today. When Jesus' body and blood are given to us with the assurance that through what he has done our sins are forgiven, well, we would see Jesus, Lord. I pray that you would help us now realize that we see a Jesus from history, not a Jesus who gives us a mystical experience. We see the one who you promised, who fulfilled your promise, and has promised to come again to take us body, soul, and spirit into your eternal kingdom. Bless us that we might grow in our faith, that we might trust Jesus fully. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. A lot of times after church and during the week on the fall, we've got a dear member of our congregation, Linda Johnson, who sings that song, God Will Take Care of You. We all know that one, right? Through every day or all the way. Beautiful song. A lot of times, though, we think only of temporal things when we think of God taking care of us. And God does take care of all of our temporal needs as he wills. He taught us, Jesus taught us to pray. One petition that even comes before the petition, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It says, give us this day our daily bread. We live at a time when we become used to uh, not only getting our daily bread, we think we've got bread for the next week or so. And once we get less than a week uh, stored up in our freezers and refrigerators and cupboards, we tend to go to the store where there's enough for the next year if, if, if we can preserve it all. Sometimes our thoughts only go that far, that all that we need comes from, I don't know, the bank, the grocery store, a cupboard, a refrigerator. We need to remember that ultimately everything comes from God. God will take care of you, but he's concerned not primarily about our earthly needs, though he is. He's far more concerned about our eternal needs. So we have Jesus sending the 12 out. They're sent out because God cares about eternal needs. They're, they're sent out by Jesus to proclaim what they've heard him proclaim. To tell people that the kingdom of God is near. That they should be proclaiming hope that people would have through trusting the one who came to fulfill all the promises of God from the Old Testament. The Messiah, the anointed one, the one who would come and defeat Satan, and defeat sin, and defeat death, and provide a way for people to enter the kingdom that would not only be for time, but for all eternity. So he sends his disciples out. They're sent out two by two. Sometimes when we think of that, we think, oh, they must have been Mormons. No, <laughs> they weren't Mormons. Jesus sent his disciples out two by two. We see two times that he sent disciples out. This time, he sends just the twelve. Jesus, if all the twelve went with him from town to town throughout Galilee, could only have covered so much geography. Instead, he sends them out two by two for several reasons. First, a lot more villages could have the kingdom preached to them with six pairs of two than one set of thirteen. And so he sends them out two by two, proclaiming the kingdom of God, preaching the kingdom of God, and again, they had heard Jesus preach the truth, so they knew what to preach. But he also gave them the ability, an ability that they didn't have, that came from Jesus, not from themselves. Two things are mentioned by Luke, to cast out demons, to drive out demons, and to cure diseases. These were necessary so that it could be seen that when they proclaimed the hope of the kingdom of God in the Anointed One, in Jesus, that people would know that they had authority, that the message they were proclaiming had authority 
that they shouldn't listen to other messages where that authority was not established, but they should listen to what Jesus and his disciples proclaimed. While they're sent out, it's important for us to note that the miracles were given again to establish the authority. The important thing that Jesus sent them with is the message. The message to repent. That means to turn away from hope in anything else, to turn away from hope in your good deeds, hope in the false gods that existed in that day, hope in anything we might do or left undone, and instead to trust in the one God provided, called to enter the kingdom of God through faith in, in the promise of God that's kept in Jesus Christ. That's the important reason they were sent out. But while they were sent out, we have to realize they were on a training mission. During Jesus' lifetime, the ministry of the kingdom of God, the ministry of the gospel, proclamation, was to the people of Israel, Samaria, Galilee. Uh, they were the main recipients. There were a few Gentiles that heard the word of God. Jesus knew that after he died and rose again, the disciples would be sent far and wide throughout the world proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God and that many Gentiles around the world would come to know him and trust in him as Savior and Lord. They needed preparation before they were sent into all the world, so they were sent into far more familiar places while Jesus was still with them. And while they were sent out, they were given instructions on, on how they were to go out in order that they might learn when they went out to trust God and that God would provide for all their needs. I've done quite a bit of traveling over the last several months, and I have to admit I'm really tired of all the packing and unpacking and repacking and unpacking back and forth and back and forth, especially since I got that machine, that CPAP thing. Got to take it apart and put it in and then take it out and put it back together. And, but I wouldn't go without it anymore because I don't sleep well without it, neither does anybody else who rooms with me. So packing and unpacking, it's kind of interesting to see that Jesus wants his disciples to not worry about what they bring. As a matter of fact, they're not supposed to bring anything, it looks like. They're to wear the clothes they have on. They're not to bring an extra staff or an extra tunic. Might get cold, but they weren't supposed to bring an extra tunic. They were to take nothing for their journey, not an extra staff, no bag to carry, things you might need on the, on the travels that you're going to go on, no bread, don't bring any food at all with you, don't bring any money, and, and that means that they had to leave their MasterCard and Visa at home too, not just currency. Any way to purchase items was to be left behind they weren't even then able to pay to stay at an inn along the way. So they were to be dependent on the hospitality of the people in the towns they entered. In every way then, their source of what they need to live from day to day was not their planning ahead of time, not their own riches, the, the only thing they could rely on as they traveled was very similar to what the Israelites had to depend on in the wilderness. And that was the direct provision of God himself. Jesus wanted them to learn that God would take care of them. He wanted them to learn for all their needs, eternal and temporal, to trust in God. And so... That's the way they traveled. Why does Jesus give them instruction in whatever house you have to stay there until you leave that town? Well, as they preached the gospel, no doubt people would have responded negatively when they, the whole town responded negatively and said, we don't want to hear what you have to say. They were to shake the dust off their shoes, off their sandals on their way out as a testimony against them, to, it essentially said to them, we brought you the good news of the kingdom of God and you were unwilling to hear it. And so we leave everything here, what happens to you now, you're responsible for. But in towns where people were receptive to the message that the disciples 
proclaimed the message to repent and to trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord. In those towns where people were receptive, they would get invited to stay. Please come and stay with us. And they did get those invitations in many towns. Now it's kind of interesting how human nature works. Oftentimes it's poor, poor people who are first of all most receptive to the message of the gospel, but second of all, who are more willing often to take in guests and to practice hospitality. Jesus didn't want the disciples to go into a poor person's house and, and spend one night there and the next day somebody who was better off and had a nicer house come to them and say, you know what, that's kind of a shabby place you're staying. Why don't you come and stay with me? That would be an insult to that poor person, first of all. And second of all, wherever they were invited to stay, God would provide. That's where Jesus wanted them to stay. So as long as they stayed in the town, as long as people were open to hearing the gospel, they were to stay in the first place they were invited to stay. And then move to the next town and, and watch for God's provision there. When they returned to Jesus, we read the other Gospels that they had many great accounts to share with Jesus about how God had provided for them and how they did find reception for the Gospel. A marvelous thing. They were being taught to trust in God. Later on, when they went throughout the world, Jesus told them, bring them items that you need. But even then, when they brought items that they needed, they weren't to trust ultimately in their own planning and their own provisions. When you travel abroad, a lot of times, no matter how well you plan, you, you run into needs that you don't expect. They were to learn to trust in God as, as they traveled around familiar territory that they may not trust in their own wisdom, in their own provisions when they went later on, but always look to God, always pray to God that he would take care of them. And God proved himself faithful. So the last part of this text seems to have something so totally different. We might wonder why in the world are we looking at these together. In verse 7 it tells us that Herod the Tetrarch, this is the one who Jesus would meet later on. He desired to see Jesus. He's the one who put John the baptizer to death, had him beheaded. Maybe it was Herodias, his, his uh, wife, well his brother's wife, who he took to be his own wife, uh, who suggested that this be the right thing for uh, their daughter, her daughter, uh, to get from Herod. Anyway, Herod the Tetrarch, who had put John to death, now was wondering what was going on as, as he heard about these miracles being performed, as he heard uh, about people coming to trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord. What does that have to do with the disciples being sent out? Herod wanted to see Jesus, and he did. Jesus didn't perform any miracles for him. Pilate sent Jesus to Herod uh, when he was being tried by the Sanhedrin and then also by Pilate. He didn't give any defense to Herod. He didn't perform any miracles for Herod. Herod sent him back to Pilate. Well, what's the point of having this text along with, with a text that tells us about the sending out of the 12. And I, and I find the answer in what Paul says much later on, years later, to King Agrippa. When Paul shares the testimony about Jesus, his calling of Paul, and his being sent out to share who Jesus is and what he did, to share that Jesus died for the sins of the world and and rose again to share that Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament scriptures that said the Messiah, the anointed one, must die and, and would be raised again. At the very end of Paul's testimony, he says, the king is familiar with all these things. And I can speak freely to him. I'm convinced that none of these things have escaped your notice, Agrippa, because none of it was done in a corner. The point is that what Jesus did while he lived on earth, he did in time, space, history. And, and it wasn't something that was secretly done that only a few people knew about. 
The miracles Jesus performed, the message he proclaimed, was known far and wide. As his disciples went out and continued the ministry Jesus called them to do, the news spread quickly. And it went so far that even in Herod's palace, Herod the Tetrarch now, even in his palace, those who worked in the palace knew what was going on. They heard about it. It was known by the poor people in the villages. It was known by those who were of royal blood. None of it was done in a corner. Why is that important? It's important because our faith rests on what God did, what he fulfilled of his promises, what he did in time, space, history. If what is claimed to have been done was not done, then our hope is empty. Ours is not a religion of some mystical experience that we might have, some spiritual experience, nor is it a religion of earning our way into God's presence by all the good deeds we do, hopefully outnumbering the, the slip-ups we have. Our hope rests on the promises God made, the promises he fulfilled in time-space history, and the testimony of what was done that's carried on not only in the day in which that promise was fulfilled in the day of Jesus, but that testimony is brought to us today. And so these passages are marvelous passages that even Herod in his palace knew what was going on at the time, and later on, decades later, Paul was able to say to Festus, you know, what I'm telling you is not new to you. You've, you've heard all these things. You know about these things. People have talked about them. They're not just rumors. They took place. None of it has escaped your notice. None of it was done in a corner. That's important when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We need to know that his claims are, are true and substantial, that we can trust in them, that we can rely on them. And so we see that the way God takes care of us was not done in some secret way, with some secret knowledge. It was not done in a way where we rest in some experience we have internally or in some works that we do. Our hope rests in what he did what Jesus did, and we need to be able to rely on the fact that he did what God promised would be done. That he lived a righteous life, that he became like a lamb slaughtered for the forgiveness of sins as he shed his blood on a cross. But that he did not remain in a tomb, but rather rose from the dead. Paul makes clear in 1 Corinthians 15, and we focus on this quite often on Easter Sunday, but he says if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then our faith is useless. Then, of all men, we're to be most pitied. Then we should just eat, drink, and marry, for we're going to die. And that's it. How do we know that there's life after death? Well, if we're looking at anything we've done, we'll never be certain. If we're looking at some mystical experience, we'll never have assurance. God wants us to know that Jesus is the one who came to die for our sins. He is the one who came to provide for us victory over Satan's lies, over sin and over death, that we might believe the truth instead of be fooled by lies, that we might Know that for us, death leads us into the presence of God for all eternity. That sin and all of our guilt have been removed from us completely. And so what Jesus did, he did not do in a hidden way. He did it so openly that everyone knew about it. And as the disciples proclaimed, repentance and faith in Jesus had found enemies. But it couldn't find anybody. That message could not find anybody that could refute what had actually taken place in that time. 
We need to look at the Gospels we have in the Bible and come to understand and the letters that God inspired the apostles to, to write and understand that these are documents that tell us what took place in history and what it means to us today. Our hope does not rest inside of us. It rests outside of us. It rests in Jesus, who he is, and what he did. And since God wants us to have salvation in Jesus, none of these things were hidden. They were well known, recorded in the generations where the events took place and handed down them by faithful witnesses. For, for us to read, to hear, and as the Holy Spirit works through that word, that our faith might grow strong, and that we, even in the time of our death, might die with joy and peace, knowing that our peace isn't inside, not primarily, it results in peace inside, and our peace is one outside of us, and it's complete. Our hope rests in one who died and rose again, so that we can be sure that what God promises, eternal life with Him, is a certain promise. God will take care of you. Will He always give you what you want or need while you're on this earth? Will he take care of you in ways that, that you always want? And the answer to that is no. God's main concern for us is that we have eternal treasure that cannot be taken away. God is a loving Father who will discipline us. When we think of discipline, we often think only of punishment. That's not what the word discipline means. It means to train. He does discipline us through our lives, by withholding and giving in times and ways that we would not take hold of the things of this world and allow them to become our treasure. He gives and takes away in such a way that we would look outside of ourselves and away from our own experiences for hope and find that God has supplied what we need for eternal life. And all of that is in Jesus Christ, that we would fix our eyes on Jesus and, and find there the perfect hope, the perfect peace, and the perfect joy that we need now and for all eternity. Jesus wants to assure sinners, those who are unworthy, that this is for them, for us then, for us who are confessing our sins. By coming to us, even as he went to his disciples who struggled with their faith so terribly, even though they were with Jesus. And he gives us bread and wine and he says, this is my body, this is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. And he says to us, take and eat, drink of it, all of you. Our hope rests in what Jesus did for us in eternity and in who he is, the Son of God and the Son of Man. But the assurance that what he did is for me today is given to us both through the proclamation of the word and the calling to trust in him as the Holy Spirit accompanies the word of God and gives the gift of life, but also through physical means, means whereby we receive the body and blood of Jesus with the assurance that in what he accomplished, forgiveness of sins is given to us. God longs for us to be His. Today may our faith rest not in anything we do. May it not rest in any experience we have. May it rest in who Jesus is and what He did, what He gives. Amen. We'll sing together number 565. My faith has found the rest of the place.
way of coming. In a worthy manner to receive God's, Jesus' body and blood, to be worthy means to recognize your unworthiness, and to know that he has supplied all you need by grace. Dearly beloved, as we purpose to come to the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ, we should carefully examine ourselves as St. Paul exhorts us. For this holy sacrament has been instituted for the special comfort and strengthening of those who humbly confess their sins, of those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. But if we examine ourselves, we'll find nothing in us but sin and death. We'll find we're unable to set ourselves free. Therefore, our Lord Jesus Christ has had mercy on us. He has taken on himself our nature so that he might fulfill for us the whole will and law of God. And for our deliverance suffer death and all that we, because of our sins, deserve. To the end that we should the more confidently believe this and be strengthened by our faith, he instituted the sacrament of his supper in which he feeds us with his body and gives us to drink of his blood. Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks of this cup firmly believing the words of Christ dwells in Christ and Christ in him. And he has eternal life. We should also receive this in remembrance of Jesus, remembering his death and how he was delivered for our sins, how also he was raised again for our justification. And respond then with grateful hearts by taking up our cross and following him and according to his command by loving one another even as he has loved us. And we are all one bread and one body even as we are partakers of this one bread and drink of this one cup. As we prepare then let's bow together before our Lord and confess our sins. Dear Heavenly Father, we bow before you to confess that we have sinned against you in our words, actions, and our thoughts. We come to ask your forgiveness, to seek your great mercy. We come to you with the merits of Jesus Christ, not our own. Look not on our sins or our iniquity, but wash us in the blood of Jesus Christ, so that we may be clean before you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Thou hast promised to receive us, poor and sinful though we be. Thou hast mercy to relieve us, grace to cleanse and now to free. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early man was turned to. Lord, thank you that as you sent out the twelve, 
So today, out of love for the lost, you send us out today. Thank you for the ways in which you teach us to trust in you and to rely on you. But also thank you, Lord, for giving us the means that we can go beyond our neighborhoods and our work and our schools. Thank you for giving us the means that, as you have called others, we can send them to many parts of the world. Bless these gifts, we pray, Lord, that the message of your kingdom might spread far and wide, and that many, through hearing the good news of Jesus Christ, might come to repent some faith, and might be fed in that faith until they're brought home to be with you. So, Lord, use these gifts, we pray, to do your eternal work, for we ask this in Jesus' name, amen.
by your grace we might hang on to these things, but we also then pray for ourselves. First, that we'd never take these things for granted, but then also that we might recognize all these things come from your hand and that we might live in dependence on you. But also we might live with thankful hearts, not just celebrating one day a year called Thanksgiving, but Lord, that we would recognize that for all you've done in providing for us, out of fatherly and divine goodness and mercy without any merit or worthiness in us, that the only right response we might have would be to thank, praise, serve, and obey you. Work in us, Heavenly Father, that we might be thankful for all you give to us, and especially we might cling to the treasure you give us that cannot be taken away, even eternal life in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hear us, Lord, as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Uh, Richard, would you come forward? And then I'll call you all to come and receive the words. So. Jesus Christ, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Come.
the number these days are? Just, just, all ladies like me. You So all your friends in school have to be too? Yeah. yeah. More? Yeah. Nice. But no more? I got these names flashing the door and it's like, which, which one is it? I got rivers in the chat. Oh, 